Uh, thanks again for having us. We are sharing the time, so we'll each uh, talk about five minutes about our project. This is an image from a cultural burn of deer grass out of the tending and gathering garden at the Cache Creek Nature Preserve. I think that's the land in there in the foreground. Okay, so what is Keepers of the Flame? This is an initiative that's been going for about the last five years. It's a collaboratively developed with several graduate students in Native American studies and ecology. Uh, it's an initiative to learn about cultural fire, the application of fire for taking care of the land, carrying out traditional responsibilities, making sure foods and medicines come back stronger and that landscapes are healthy. And it's also about supporting native led restoration and stewardship. So we have several components. We participate in hands-on workshops. That picture at the bottom is a, is a picture from a workshop hosted by North Fork Mono Chairman Ron Good. And it was really his invitation to come down and learn about cultural burning with him on the land in Mariposa that led to the development of the Keepers of the Flame course. So the course is now Native American Studies 165. Uh, we also occasionally collaborate with sister courses at other institutions. Uh, Danny Manning had a course at Feather River College this last year, and we did an exchange with them. And there are also alum of this program who are now faculty at other universities, and we hope to exchange with them in the future. Um, since we've been going for about five years, it's really become a community, a network of learners committed to learning and teaching about cultural fire, and there's opportunities for participations in burns throughout the year. And as I mentioned, it's really a set of relationships, I think, between the students who participate, the practitioners who are teaching and working with the students and the land, the places we're working and returning to, and learning about fire itself. The picture at the top uh, is, again, burning deer grass at the Tending and Gathering Garden with Diana Elmanderas, who is Nisanan, Wintun, uh, Hupa, uh, a practitioner who's very generous with her time teaching uh, students and faculty. So learning outcomes for this program, I wanted to go over them briefly just to get a sense of what we aim for people to walk away with after participating. And these were produced collectively uh, with Denise Martinez, Melinda Adams, Nina Fontana, Chris Adlem, myself, and others. So I always want to recognize the partners involved in this work. So we foreground recognizing the importance and scope of indigenous stewardship as throughout the landscape and then uh, suppressed through colonial invasion and always continuing, but really resurging in the public eye now. Um, we question inherited beliefs and behaviors about fire, for example, as always negative and how forests should be stewarded or cared for involving fire. We work to identify assumptions that underline that underlie questions, models, research, and approaches to forest management that may leave out fire or may not be inclusive of indigenous-led cultural fire. We question who are the experts on forest management, and we really defer to cultural practitioners who have knowledge passed down about fire and its effect on different species on the landscape and its um, importance to people and place. On the right is a picture of my son bringing fire to Redbud at Yochidihi Wintun Nation. They hosted a cultural burn last year, and it was the first time they were bringing back fire to an oak grove in 100 years. So it was a very moving um, event. We work to learn the hands-on with practitioners. The hands-on learning is really important. But we also have a portion of hosting speakers to speak about different issues they're facing, policies, and bringing back cultural fire etc. We work to identify barriers and opportunities facing Indigenous-led implementation of cultural burning and other landscape stewardship techniques. One of our projects right now is with Indigenous public domain allotment holders throughout California and looking at barriers to bringing back fire on public domain allotments and how we might address those. And throughout it all is relationships and relationality and really taking the time, raising the funds, to invest in building relationships across cultural across cultures and that are reciprocal. So a couple of thoughts about the context and interventions of Keepers of the Flame. Um, many may already know on this call that California, which is where we started and where we focused, 
California's land and waterscapes have really developed with fire. Some species only uh, grow in response to fire. There's a long record of naturally occurring fires, small fires that occurred with lightning and were set by native people. Uh, we know that cultural fire is central to the formation of landscapes, the assemblage of species, and to community and cultural perpetuation. The picture on the top is of Danny Manning holding a baby basket, and he is describing there how you can only get the materials for the basket with careful land stewardship and the application of fire so that you get new straight shoots that you can use to weave a nice even basket. We have a context which was just mentioned in the last presentation as well of increasing temperature and aridity, uh, and that we argue is intertwined with a legacy of fire suppression, attempted removal of indigenous people from landscapes. And together that leads to intensive fire risk and also impacts on communities who no longer can easily develop, steward, source these materials to make baskets and other material culture. And we believe that traditional knowledge of landscape stewardship applied in native led collaborative restoration is going to have benefits for ecosystem health, for climate adaptation to these changes we see around us, uh, for employment, empowerment, and really addressing uh, and dealing with a painful history by supporting um, recognition of the importance of land stewardship today and carrying on perpetuating material culture. So part of our intervention is to train those who are are coming through our programs at UC Davis, current and future resource stewards. We also have people who enroll who are from off campus and members of the public who come to our public workshops, but to provide information on the importance of cultural burning, how to respectfully collaborate and developing senses of relationality and responsibility to others and to place. And the picture on the bottom is again from the workshop at Yochidihi last year. So there are multiple research projects associated with this initiative. You're going to hear from Landon Noland, he's in the top picture there, about his work with Sourberry and Weavers. Uh, we have also worked to support projects about assessing the scope of cultural fire application and identifying barriers, working to bring fire to public domain allotments. What people have worked, Melinda Adams worked on soil studies, looking at the outcomes of stewardship. We've had people look at baseline conditions of land and, and uh, what cultural fire brings to the landscape. That's happened in a couple different places in Northern and Southern California. We support tribal-led, tribal-specific burn trainings and cultural fire exchanges between burners in different places. On the example I noted here between cultural burners in Oregon and in California uh, and other exchanges on bringing cultural burning planning into an indigenous-led emergency planning uh, and these are just some of our some of our projects. So now I'll hand it over to Landon to speak. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So my name is Landon, and I, I just, you know, in interest of time, I'm going to talk really fast. Um, but cultural burning is really important for Indigenous practitioners um, because it is a, a way that people get the products that they need to practice their culture. And my research in particular looks at basketry. This is um, a study done by Tony Marks Block, who was studying hazel basketry uh, in Northern California. And it shows that when you don't have any type of management, you have very, very little basketry material, if not zero. Uh, when you do mechanical management, such as cutting, um, you do gain significantly more material but ultimately the best ways to produce basketry material for indigenous cultures is by, uh, in this case, various methods of burning the material. Uh, and so it's really important. I study specifically a plant called sourberry. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so sourberry is, or rust trilobata, uh, skunk bush, various names for the same plant, is a really important basketry material that uh, requires fire to, to, to produce enough basketry materials to um, weave uh, adequate amounts of baskets for community members. And so this is just an aerial imagery of what a pilot study for burning of sourberry basketry looks like. You can kind of see these 
funky squares on the landscape. And this is kind of what it looks like trying to, you know, fit ecological methods into cultural burning. Um, but wh why is it important in the context of climate change? Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So ultimately, this is research that is based on um, community members, right, and, and the needs of culture uh, to perpetuate. Uh, and climate change can feel like a really, really big problem. It is a really big problem. It's an ecological problem. It's an environmental problem. Uh, and, and so as forestry and fire management, we have these really large fires. Um, and, and some of that is due to climate change, but also some of that is due to you know, the intentional removal of indigenous people from the landscape and, and the colonial legacy of fire exclusion on the landscape for the last century. And so sometimes it's important to not think of climate change as an ecological problem, but also as a community problem. And, and so doing this type of research to help revitalize uh, communities and bringing fire back to the landscape, I think, is critical because... Uh, cultural practices are also affected by climate change, which is why these weavers asked me to do these ecological studies to see how um, to create a baseline, essentially, for how their practices are being affected um, by changing in precipitation patterns and aridity uh, in California, which is highly variable through climate change. Next slide, please. Um, and so when when we're thinking about cultural fire and in the context of climate change, um, I think of it as really important to think about, you know, the future of fire and the, fu the future of indigenous community fire management. Um, I really like this definition of indigenous futurities, um, which is essentially creating the spaces to dream and imagine, you know, what does an indigenous future look like? And the Keepers of the Flame is a really cool and powerful and unique space to begin doing that. You know, this it's what five years ago essentially started me into thinking about how I can help my own um, communities, uh, you know, react to climate change. Um, so next slide, please. And so ultimately, right, it's really important to think about climate change from this um, smaller lens as well. It's really important to reforest our, our, our forests after fire as well. Um, but thinking about how we can kind of think about the narrative of uh, climate change and a forest fire from a smaller lens and, and utilizing and, and uh, uplifting indigenous knowledges and helping indigenous communities reclaim that knowledge, uh, you know, is a self-determined plan for climate change, which I think is really important. Thank you.